Hey devs, and welcome back to another episode of the Goobar podcast, where we talk about building great software and helping others to do the same. In this week's episode, we're talking Jetpack Compose. And specifically, we're talking about some tips that I and my team have been finding really helpful as we've been learning how to use Jetpack Compose in our production application. So uh, sit right back, whether you're, you're out on a walk, a run, driving to work, whatever, hopefully you're, you're ready and excited and we're gonna dive into Jetpack Compose right after this. All right, so a little context here. Our team has been using Compose for the, the past few months, and we've been learning a lot as we have been and working more with the APIs, learning to write more maybe idiomatic Compose, uh, building up our component library, using Compose in different contexts and to do different types of work, some of it integrating with existing code, some of it completely new greenfield development, so our, our thoughts and our ideas around how to work with Compose have evolved. So this sort of list here is just kind of a, an off the top of my head kind of list or, or collection of some, some ideas that I have found interesting or really helpful. So if this is a, a little free form, a little rambly, I apologize. This is, like I said, it's a little bit more unstructured than typical because I just want to kind of like share some stuff that's really been on my mind lately, uh, working with Compose, which I'm loving. Uh, if you if you want to hear a little bit more about my thoughts just on Compose in general, I think uh, at the time of this episode coming out, it should be last week's episode. I uh, chatted just about Compose in, in general and some of the things I really like about it and, and even a couple of things I, I didn't like about it so much. So if you want to learn more about my general thoughts on Compose, you can check out that episode. All right, so... Now uh, let's just chat about Compose tips. So the first thing that I really like about Compose, and I called this out in the previous episode, I think, is that Compose APIs I find to be very self-documenting. What do I mean by self-documenting? It means that when I have questions about how to do something with a particular API, for example, how do I customize the sort of keyboard action button when working with a text field, this was something I had a question about. Rather than having to go out to Stack Overflow or even Google it, I looked at the, the parameters and the types and the, the default values of the text field. And just by looking at the ways I could configure the text field composable, I was able to actually discover and understand how to customize that keyboard action button. So this is sort of what I mean by APIs being self-documenting. It means that if you click into a composable, you examine its parameters, you look at the typed values that you can pass in, the, the enums or sealed classes, everything, it helps you understand what you can do with something just by looking at how you can configure it. So I really encourage you, if you're starting to work with Compose and you have questions around how do I customize this, how do I do this, or how do I do that, Clicking into the, the APIs themselves within Android Studio is really helpful. Um, if, you're, if you're on a Mac, you can do this by holding uh, command and then left clicking on the, the function name or the, the composable name. On Windows, I think it's probably uh, control click. But if you do this, you can start to get a good sense of how to better work with the APIs. And I think that goes a long ways towards understanding what you can do and how to do it. Now, uh, another thought on this idea of API design, and this is something I find really interesting and, and I really like about Compo Compose, is that it uses uh, slot-based design in a lot of places. So again, if you're not familiar, what is slot-based design? Slot-based design is basically the, this idea that to make composables reusable, rather than maybe taking in a specific concrete type to do something, a composable might sort of section off or, or might reserve a section of itself to draw some content, but it doesn't make assumptions around what that content will be. It lets the, the call site determine what that content should be 
and it will take care of simply drawing the provided content into the reserved space. So that was all very abstract. What does that mean in a concrete example? Well, let's imagine you have an app bar. And now let's imagine that you want to show a title in that app bar. How would you design the API for that? Well, in some situations, you might simply have a string and you might want to show the string into the app bar position. So you could have a, an app bar composable that takes in a string and, and shows that. However, in some situations, you might have a, a resource ID. And so you might want to have a, an overload that takes in a resource ID instead. You might also have some situations where you want something really custom in the title. Maybe you want custom typography. Maybe you want to put an icon or something up there in the, the title slot. So now you would have to account for those situations. But you would not want all of them to be roughly drawn in the same place as well for consistency's sake. So rather than having overloads for every one of these, in sort of the slot-based design approach, rather than taking in text or a resource ID or you know icon plus text, a lot of the Compose APIs will take in a Lambda that simply lets you provide the content that you want drawn into the title area. And then the app bar composable itself will take care of reserving that title space and draw your content into it. So it, it sort of, it's, it's almost inversion of control a little bit for like the content itself that gets drawn in. So rather than you passing in the data and the composable handles all of the drawing, you actually get to pass in the way the rendering is going to take place. And this makes a lot of the APIs really flexible. This is something that my team has been embracing for some base components we have such as a as kind of a base card component so we we define maybe what the the base card looks like shadows corner radiuses and such and then we reserve some sections of the card to draw certain things but we don't enforce particular apis for whether you need to pass in a string resource or an icon resource versus an icon versus text so it's it's helping us be more flexible in the way we're working with these things so it's it's something that i find really really interesting and really helpful if you're if you're not familiar with that there's um there's some discussion around it in the the jetpack compose documentation which i think is really illuminating um, and i would encourage you to to check that out Another thing that I find really helpful about Compose is that everything tend, maybe not everything, but most things tend to have very sensible default values. Uh, so what, what does this mean? It means that if you have an optional parameter to one of your composables, rather than that parameter maybe being null, or rather than not including that parameter altogether, it means that it has a default value that you can use in most situations, but then it's there to customize in the situations where you need it. So, so again, here's an example from the work my team has been doing recently. Let's imagine that you have some text composables that represent the sort of different typography, uh, uh, let's say types in your design system. So, you know, you can define typographies like H1, H2, subheading one, and apply them to your theme. And you could use those using the base text composable and then sort of passing in the typography style to it each time. We've been trying to simplify that a little bit. So we have H1, H2, subheading one composables that sort of do this internally. Now to customize this, to start, we had these composables be very simple. They would take in just a text and, and do the rest of the drawing. But what happens with that, with that really simplified API means that we also have less flexibility in how we, uh, we work with it in different situations. So let's say we then need H1 bold. How do we do that? Well, we could make an H1 bold text composable and, and add the, the bold styling internally to that. And that was something we tried for a little bit. But the problem with it is that now you start needing to have lots of different sort of overloads and different versions to represent really just like variations of the same thing. So rather than having these sort of different individual composables, 
what we've been finding is that it's really helpful to sort of expose more of the properties that you might want to use to customize your composable. So we expose those in the API and we provide the default value. So our default weight might just be normal rather than bold. But if someone needs the bold version, they can go ahead and pass that in. For people that don't need it, they don't even have to know it's there because of the, the magic of Kotlin's default values. We can just omit that parameter altogether when, when invoking the function and we'll get the, the default weight for that. But for the situations where we do want to customize it, being able to have that parameter available to us is really helpful. So when you're building your, uh, your composables, when you're building out your component library and stuff, think about this. Like what are the different ways you might want to reuse this and think about what parameters would be helpful to expose in that API. And then also think about what the, the good default values would be so that in most situations, uh, developers on your team can use the, the just very default case where they only have to provide what is absolutely necessary to get the functionality they're looking for. Okay, shifting gears a little bit here, moving away from, from APIs a bit. Something that I think is really interesting and find really helpful in different situations are our previews. And something that I don't see folks talking about as much about composable previews is that you can customize your previews to preview your composable in different situations. So let's say you have a custom button component that you're trying to preview. So you can have just a default preview that shows what that button looks like with sort of your, your default theme. You could also have another preview then that shows what that looks like using your dark theme, for example. You could have another preview that shows what it looks like on a small phone versus a large phone. So you can start to preview more sort of variations of your composable than just sort of like the base case. And, and the way that we can do this is by actually uh, modifying the, the preview annotation on our composable. You can pass parameters to that and do things like set the, the UI mode. You can do things like set sort of the, the device skin to use for the, the preview. And there's actually some built-in ones like a Nexus 5 if you're looking for a small screen device or, or a Pixel 3, for example, or a Pixel C if you're looking for a tablet. And these are sort of built in, they're, they're strongly typed, so they're easy to discover. And so you can actually create multiple preview methods, configure the preview annotation for different situations, and then maybe get four or five different views into what your component looks like as you're building it out. So then as you're building it out, you can check these previews and be verifying kind of as you go that they look the way you expect in some of these different situations, which I think is really helpful. Now I know one of the sort of complaints with Compose that people have talked about this, and I talked about it in my episode last week, is that uh, sometimes um, preview speeds can be really slow, or they they can kind of break, or or they're just pro so slow that they're actually not even useful anymore, and you don't even care <laughs> if they really break. And so something that my team has been uh, able to kind of take advantage of is that modularizing our app has really helped improve build speed. And I think this works on two fronts. So one, we've done a lot of work in general in the past year, year and a half to improve the build speeds of our application. So we've applied a lot of Gradle optimizations, uh, uh, local caching, remote caching. We've done a lot of work to make sure that our project takes advantage of of, you know, it's just like caching mechanisms and isn't building more than it needs to when we rebuild something. So right off the bat, that helps with the preview speeds because you have to run particular Gradle tasks to refresh the preview. And anytime you're doing that, you start kicking off builds, those tasks might have dependencies. So the more efficient your build can be kind of in general, the faster your, your previews should hopefully be. Then on the, the other side of this, if you can sort of shrink the space of what needs to be rebuilt, you can also increase your preview sort of refresh speeds. So by doing a lot of our compose work in separate 
modules that aren't our sort of a big, large app module where a lot of our code lives, but instead in small sort of new like greenfield modules that are very focused on specific functionality, that allows the previews to be really quick. So for example, a new module work, working on right now for a kind of an updated compose experience, it uh, refreshes the preview in three, four, five, six seconds. It's something very short, something that you don't mind paying the cost of on sort of a, you know, a relatively new, let's say MacBook Pro. So we have a good machine that is fast and whatnot, um, but even on some of the lower end devices that some of our devs are working on, it's still a, a fairly reasonable cost to refresh the preview. And so this is kind of the, the core tip here, I think, is that if you can do your compose work in a separate module, so you can try and limit the amount of code that needs to be re sort of compiled, rebuilt to, to refresh your preview. Now, building on this, let's say you can't do much of the modularization. Let's say you're, um, you're, you don't have a lot of modularization or build optimizations in place. Another potential way to try and get faster previews and a faster sort of dev to, to deploy to verification sort of turnaround time is that you could build a, a sandbox app. You could build a separate application to sort of build out your Compose component library. And this is another thing that we've done. We, we aren't using it as, a, as much now, but we were using it quite a bit when we were first starting with Compose and first starting to build out some of our common composables. The idea here is that we have kind of a, a very low level uh, Compose, so let's say design system module for our project where we put a lot of our most low level commonly used composables. We then have this sort of separate sandbox app that lives sort of side by side with the main app in, in our repo. And the sandbox app is basically there solely to try out these, these composables. We basically just have screens where we have different variations of buttons, another screen that has different variation of text, another one that has different variations of our cards. And it lets us sort of make changes, deploy to the device, interact with it on the device, very quickly because it is this small app. It only has to recompile sort of a very small amount of code whenever you want to redeploy the project. So it's been really helpful for quick developer turnaround times. It also has potential as sort of a tool to help the design team sort of see what you're building and to potentially verify that the components you're building interact the way they want, the, the way that or behave the way that you would expect. So that's, I think it's a pretty interesting idea if your team is struggling with like previews or just struggling with the developer experience because of maybe slow builds, you could look at pulling some of those base things out and verifying them in a separate application. Okay, so now shifting gears a little bit more, these last couple are gonna be more around uh, uh, theming in Compose. So just the, the first tip here will be very straight to the point. If you can, kind of whenever possible, try and pull your colors, uh, or, or not even just colors, colors, typography, shapes, uh, as much as possible, I think, pull from sort of material theme. At the, so the very root level of your, your composable functionality, you're probably overriding your theme with your custom colors and, and sizes and things like that, typography. When you're building your low-level components then, if you reference material theme, then it means that if you change the theme, your components will change and, and it, everything will kind of work as, as you might expect it to. If in your low level composables, you're actually reaching out and referencing one-off sizes or, or colors or typographies directly, you kind of break this expectation that the, the styling is derived from, from the theme. You're kind of changing and now everything is kind of derived from whatever the heck it wants to be derived from. So if you can, pull things from the theme. Now, why is this important? Well, it's because theming is contextual and because it just makes it easier to change. But the, for this tip here, it's because theming is contextual. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you have some text and you render it on, let's say, a, a card versus rendering it on just sort of like the window background, 
that text is going to get its color sort of based on the context in which it's being drawn. So if you are drawing into something that is considered a, a surface, so like, like again, a card, I believe, is considered a surface and pulls its color from the surface color of your theme. In that situation, the text is then going to grab its color from the on-surface color of your theme. So it is smart enough to recognize, oh, I'm being drawn onto a surface, then I need the on-surface color to ensure my contrast. Um, and this works for text, it works for icons. Similarly, maybe you're drawing into the background, then you have on background color as well. There's also things like on primary. So maybe your app bar is using your primary color. So you might then wanna make sure that your on primary color is contrasting and then uh, set your uh, uh, composables and stuff, make sure that they are referencing the theme properly so that those uh, texts and icons and such pull from those on colors recognize the context in which they're in and help ensure that you have the, the right contrast throughout things. So again, this, this contextual theming and things pulling from the theme is good reason to make sure that you're always pulling from the material theme when you can. It's also a good reason to make sure that your theme is set up properly. So if you have a primary color, a surface color, a background color, it's a good idea to make sure that you also have defined the on primary color, the on surface color, the on background color. Now, as you're, as you're starting to get in the habit of pulling things from the theme, you might run into places where the theme doesn't support what you need. So for example, typography wise, I think by default, the material theme supports a subheading one and a subheading two sort of typography styling. But let's say you need subheading three for your particular design system. It's very possible for you to extend what's already sort of there in the material theme. We can take advantage of uh, extension functions and properties in, in Kotlin to add to sort of the, the base material theme types. So like the typography, for example, you can update that so that from within your composables, if you reference material theme, you could still do something like material theme dot typography dot subheading three. And from the call site, it'll be totally transparent that subheading three is actually maybe just an extension property with a backing field representing that custom typography style. So you can do this for things like colors, styles, shapes, and you can use that to kind of customize the material theme to fit your design system. Now, when you're doing that, I think it's worth putting out a caveat here that you want to be sort of judicious with how you do that. You don't want to just throw everything into the theme because the theme will start to have a little bit less meaning. If, if the theme suddenly has 50 different colors on it, it might be hard to keep those straight. And I think it lends itself to maybe being misused a little bit. So, so you want to think about like the semantics around it. Are there places where you have a, a consistent, let's say, uh, button radius color or something, for example. And that's kind of like this semantic thing that gets reused in a bunch of places across your design system. That might be a good thing to add. If you have a, just like a one-off color that is used in one or two places across your whole app, that is maybe not worth putting in your theme. Maybe that's a case where you do just reference the color directly. Um, another place here i think like i said the, the example of typography i think is a really good one if there are specific typography elements that you're using in your design system that aren't present in the default material theme typography object uh, extending it for that makes a lot of sense so just think about what you want uh, i think less is more in this situation but the option to extend is available and if you can extend something to make it easier to sort of keep intact this concept of pulling things from your theme by default, I think that's a good reason to look at extending the theme. All right, and now just the last one I'll call out here. If you are just sort of getting started with Compose, or really even when you've you're, you're been using Compose for, for a while, I imagine, and I imagine this would still be helpful a year from now when we're with Compose, um, having a debug theme sort of defined that you can switch into can be really helpful to understand sort of where colors are pulled from and to sort of understand the semantics around like uh, what 
color is being applied to what component in different situations. Um, so when I say a debug theme here, um, I'm referring to basically the like the color palette that we apply to our material theme sort of at the root level of our composables. So, so for us, anytime we have kind of a, a new root level composable, we provide our custom theme. And then within that, we start putting in our scaffolds and our different composables and whatnot. So within our theme, uh, we can, you know, build up a color palette using sort of the, um, I think there, there's some builder functions. It's like light mode palette or something like that. And then there's like a dark mode palette, but, but really at the end of the day, it's just providing like a set of colors. You could create effectively a, a debug palette then to set into your theme in certain situations. It could be something that you just do when you need to um, uh, use it for a dev time. It could be maybe a developer setting where you can turn it on dynamically at runtime. But basically, you could provide this sort of set of colors that are very contrasting, that are all very unique. So that when you see that, let's say your background color is purple, you know exactly, oh, background color is purple. The purple is assigned to, let's say the background color. Okay, yes, that's correct. And then maybe you see that your card is orange and you say, oh, that is pulling from the surface color. I expected that to pull from the background color. We might need to rework our theme. That's the idea of the debug theme. It lets you try and better understand where colors come from and how they map back into your material theme, which then can help you understand how to provide default color values. Um, it can help you understand how to set up your theme to make sure it maps to your design system correctly. All right. So that was, uh, that was 10 or so tips for working with Jetpack Compose. Um, again, these are things that we've been finding helpful. These could be very different. We might find that half of these things are, are terrible advice as we continue to work with Compose over the next few months. But these are things that we are finding helpful and have been working for our team so far. Uh, hopefully, they, they're interesting and helpful for you as well. I would love to hear what some of your tips for working with Compose are, what types of things that you've been finding helpful in your projects and on your teams. You can uh, reach out, let me know on social media, or send an email to podcast at goobar.dev. And with that, we will wind down this episode. I hope everybody has a great week. Until next time, devs. <laughs> <laughs>